The Scarecrow's Hat by Anil Pothalori Sarah, wait up! Thomas shouted as he scrambled down the old weathered road. How many times do I have to tell you to get gone, Thomas Crenshaw? Sarah fumed, quickening her pace. You gotta let me explain. She stopped dead in her tracks at this, giving Thomas just enough time to catch up. When he was a few feet behind her, Sarah turned on her heels and looked him in the eyes for the first time in a week. Explain what exactly? Why you stood me up Saturday night? Or why Mary Radley says that she saw you sneaking out of Debbie Altman's window? It was more of an accusation than a question, but that didn't stop Thomas from trying his best. Both! Sarah, I swear to you it's all a big pile of lies. Mary Radley's just after attention because no one ever pays her no mind. Sarah seemed to think this over for a moment. She almost wanted to believe him. But, no, it couldn't be that easy. Oh yeah? Where were you then, huh? She challenged him with newfound skepticism. My grandpa needed help out in the fields, that's all. At sundown? Sarah's hazel eyes narrowed at the half-baked excuse. Yeah, he thought foxes might be getting in the chicken coops, and he had me stay up all night trying to catch him in the act. If that's really true, then why didn't you just call to tell me? Sarah asked the frustration clear in her voice. I, I tried, but I couldn't get through to you. You know how hard it is to make calls out here. I, I really wish I could believe you, Thomas. Sarah weakened again, the hurt seeping out of the cracks in her resolve. Baby, please. Thomas started taking her hands in his and squeezing them tightly. Just tell me what I gotta do to make things right. I swear I'd do anything for you. Sarah stiffened at the sudden touch. But she didn't pull away. She just stared up at Thomas, as if the answers she was looking for were hidden somewhere in those soft, brown eyes of his. Anything? Her voice was soft and timid now. The lion had been reduced to a mouse. Thomas smiled, that perfect little smile that always got him out of trouble. Anything, baby, just name it. Sarah pursed her lip and twirled a finger through her fiery red curls as she thought it over. All right, I... I want the hat off the scarecrow on the old abandoned Dupree farm. Thomas's loving expression quickly turned to a look of confusion. Of all the things, you want that dirty old scarecrow hat? No one's ever done it before, and you know what people say about that place. If you can get me that hat, it'll show me how devoted you are to me. Every kid in town will be talking about it. Of course I can get it, it's just a scarecrow. Maybe, maybe not. Sarah muttered. Thomas tilted his head at her curiously. You believe in all that hocus pocus? Sarah crossed her arms with a huff, reminding Thomas why the request was being made in the first place. Never you mind what I do or don't believe, Thomas. You just worry about getting me that hat. All right, all right, I'm sorry. Just bring it to school tomorrow and give it to me at lunch in front of everyone. Sarah exclaimed. That'll put an end to all of this Debbie Altman talk. That explained it all loud and clear. Sarah didn't really care about the hat or the scarecrow. She just wanted all the gossip to stop. And if there was anything that could make that happen, it'd be someone getting their hands on that damn hat. All right, baby, I'll get it done. I love you, you know? I gotta get home, Thomas. I'll see you around. Was all he got in response as Sarah left him alone on the empty old stretch of road. He sighed and started his walk to the Dupree farm. Guilt swelled up like a knot in his stomach. The truth was, he had indeed been unfaithful. He still loved Sarah, at least he thought he did. But he was eager and hormonal. And like many boys his age, he had needs and urges. Sarah wanted to do the proper Christian thing and wait. Something Thomas had agreed with at first. But as time went on, he found this arrangement increasingly frustrating. Then, Debbie came along. Sweet, easy Debbie. She made everything so much better for a time. It was never serious, they both understood that perfectly. They'd sneak out, have their fun, and with his needs satisfied, Thomas was a much more agreeable boyfriend to Sarah. It went on like this for a month. Thomas was happy, Debbie was happy, and Sarah was happy too. That is, of course, until she, along with the entire school, found out what Thomas was doing. 
Now everything was so messy, and Thomas was beginning to realize what a mistake it had all been. He continued to think that fact over as he made his way onto the old farm. It was a way he knew very well, actually. His grandfather's land was right next to the Dupree's. Thomas could remember spending many restless nights staring out of his bedroom window, wondering if that old scarecrow was out there watching him. But he wasn't a child anymore. Now he saw that scarecrow for what it was. Straw and cloth and dust. Nothing more. As Thomas finally made it to the small wooden fence that separated his family's land from the Dupree's, he found himself more worried about the possibility of a snake bite rather than any old scarecrow. The Dupree's land was truly an eyesore. An unruly jungle of grass and weeds sprung up from every inch of the property. The worst of it stretching up to two feet in height. Thomas didn't want to think about all the different types of nasty critters that could be waiting for him in there. He reminded himself he was doing this for Sarah, and with a big gulp of courage, he started to climb over the fence. Unfortunately, he only managed to get one foot onto the property before a strong, leathery hand grabbed him by the collar of his shirt, and a rough, crackling voice rang out from behind him. Thomas! The boy's grandfather shouted loudly nearly sending Thomas jumping out of his own skin. What the hell do you think you're doing, boy? The old man scolded as he pulled his grandson back over the fence. Thomas tried to fight, but despite his age, the old farmer was much stronger than he. He wriggled in vain as his grandfather dragged him into the house. Once inside, Thomas was finally freed from his grandfather's grip. I've told you time and time again to stay away from that land. How many more times you need telling before you start listening? Ah, dang it, I ain't a child no more! Thomas began shouting, before his grandfather's hard stare shut him up. Then you ought to stop acting like one. And don't you ever take the Lord's name in vain. Thomas mumbled out an apology as he stared at the floor, unable to meet his grandfather's oppressive gaze. What were you doing trying to get over that fence? What's it matter? Thomas huffed. Boy, you better answer my question. The old man said coldly. Thomas knew that tone, and he knew better than to give any lip when his grandfather used it. I was gonna try to get the scarecrow's hat, he admitted, finally meeting his grandfather's eyes. To Thomas's surprise, the cold stare turned to an expression he'd never seen before. It was a solemn look, with tinges of fear, and something more. Something deeper, the old man kept buried inside. Grandpa? I was praying you wouldn't say that. But I knew it was coming, the old man answered in a defeated voice. Sit down, boy. Let's have a talk. Thomas followed his grandfather to the wooden table where they ate all their meals. And once they both sat down, his grandfather spoke again. Why do you want that hat, Thomas? There was no anger in his voice now, just concern. I messed things up real bad with Sarah, and she said giving her that hat's the only way I can make it right. Thomas was surprised by his own honesty. He hadn't wanted to tell his grandfather any of it, but it just seemed to spill out. Thomas's grandfather sighed and began rubbing his temples. I know how much you like that girl, Thomas, but I, I can't let you do that. I have to. Go talk to Sarah tomorrow. Find another way to make things right. I won't let you do it. I can't let you do that. Why not? Why is everyone in this town so damn terrified of that dumb old scarecrow? Thomas's voice peaked in frustration. Boy, how much do you know about that old farm? Just stupid bedtime stories to scare little kids. Sarah's mom told her one night that scarecrow jumped off his post and gobbled up the Duprees in their sleep and that will do the same to any children who don't mind their elders. Thomas scoffed. So you never did learn the real story of that place and that thing. That's my fault. Should have told you about it a long time ago. I guess I just didn't want to acknowledge it myself. Thomas stared at his grandfather quizzically. The promise of an explanation managed to lessen his rising temper. It all started with Virgil and Edeline Dupree. They were a Haitian couple that moved here from Louisiana. From what people say, they were kind, 
hard-working people. It was a different time, though, back when people didn't take kindly to seeing colored folk owning land, let alone them prospering because of it. That bitterness and disgust just festered, and slowly turned to rage and hate, until eventually, something evil happened. One night the townspeople came in their white hoods with their torches and their clubs. They dragged Virgil Dupree out of his own home and they tortured him. Then they hung him from the oak tree beside the house. Edeline had been visiting family in Louisiana at the time and when she came back, the only thing waiting for her was her husband's remains swinging from a branch. They never convicted anyone the police turned their back on all of it, and Edeline was inconsolable. The grief, anger, and fear all ate away at her until they just couldn't take it anymore. If the law wouldn't bring her justice, she'd get it another way. Unbeknownst to the rest of us and the town, Edeline Dupree practiced voodoo, and in her grief, in that rage, she started making the scarecrow. They say she stuffed it with talismans and mystical herbs, wrapped it in cloth dipped in strange potions, even made it a costume out of different scraps of Virgil's clothes. And once it was finished, she put it on a post in front of the house. She cut the throats of every last bit of livestock she owned at the scarecrow's feet, and with all that hatred and suffering and blood, they say that she put a demon in that scarecrow. When word got around the town that Edeline Dupree had been sacrificing animals and singing in strange languages, people were up in arms. They swarmed the farm, planning to lynch Edeline just like her husband. They never laid a finger on her though. They say that scarecrow sprung from its post and tore every last one of them up like an animal then impaled their bodies on the branches of the oak tree Virgil was hanged by, all while Edeline sat on her porch and watched. The people that remained in the town never bothered Edeline after that. She stayed in the house mad and alone until she finally drank herself to death. The bank sold the land many times over, but all the owners either died or fled soon after. Eventually, people stopped buying and the land was abandoned. Thomas stared at his grandfather wide-eyed and slack-jawed. <laughs> you really believe that load of horse shit? Thomas was flabbergasted. This was absurd. Voodoo magic, a killer scarecrow. He felt like the only sane person in a town of gullible superstitious fools. His grandfather just sighed and shook his head before continuing. I know. I thought it was nonsense when I was your age, too. Then one night I tried to steal the hat for myself. Thomas's ears pricked at this. What happened? The old man stared down at his clasped hands and took a shaky breath. I didn't ever want to have to tell anybody this story, especially you. But I can see it's something you're going to need to hear. It was me and three other people. The whole thing had been Peter Barnett's idea. He'd always been a troublemaker despite being the son of our high school principal. Peter's younger brother, Andy, tagged along wherever Peter went. There was also Carol Ann Dietz, a girl I was sweet on at the time. A faint smile spread across the old man's wrinkled lips as he remembered the girl from so long ago. I was really only going to impress her. We were all going to be the first kids in town to nab that scarecrow's hat, and that's what we thought at least. It was dark out when we all hopped that fence and started walking. Everything was normal for a while. Peter and Andy were walking ahead while I stayed back with Carol Ann. We were talking about school, joking with each other, and Carol noticed something odd. It was dead quiet out there. No crickets, no toads, no nothing. And in a place as overgrown as the Dupree's land, it just didn't add up. It spooked Andy something fierce, but we all just tried to forget it. 
Eventually, after a good deal of walking and complaining, mostly on Andy's part, we made it to the Scarecrow's post. Thomas watched as his grandfather's eyes turned glassy and his voice grew quiet and fearful as he continued. It was so unsettling up close. The thing was dressed in a moldy dark green shirt, ragged dirty blue pants and a tattered maroon shoulder cape. The getup looked like it belonged more on some New Orleans voodoo man than a scarecrow. It had such an unnaturally long and thin body in its head that the thing's head it was a pale ghostly white stuffed sack tied tight with a rope that coiled around its inhumanly long neck. It had long, dirty straw for hair, and the only facial features the thing had was a long stitched smile and another set of stitches higher up on the head that almost looked like a single shut eye. And on top was the damn hat. It was a large, wide-brimmed hat that was the same maroon color as the cape with two big black feathers sticking out the side. The worst thing about it, though, was the way it was posed. The post was shaped like a large cross. The scarecrow's arms were tied to it by barbed wire. Its head was resting on its shoulder like some sick mockery of the crucifixion. We all just stood and stared in awe and disgust at the thing until Peter finally piped up and snapped us all out of it. The post was so tall that none of us could reach that hat on our own, so Peter had Andy climb on his shoulders to reach it while me and Carol watched. And that was fine by me. I didn't want to get any closer to this thing. I was just glad we were gonna get the hat and get out of there, but, but just as Andy was about to reach it, he let out this terrible shriek and fell off his brother's shoulders flat onto the ground. We all started cussing him out for scaring the life out of us when he started shivering and pointing at the scarecrow. That's when we all saw it. The thing was staring at us with a big bloody red eye. The damn thing had an eye. It lifted its head off its shoulder with an awful cracking noise and just stared down at us with that single piercing red eye. Then it opened its mouth with a wet tearing noise and took the shrillest, most bone chilling breath of air I'd ever heard. It was as if the thing hadn't used its lungs in decades. The thing started to jitter and writhe on the post until two hands burst out of its sleeves. The thing didn't have human hands, they looked more like giant crow's feet. I can still remember the way it wiggled those three sharp clawed fingers. Once it sprouted those hands, its back started to throb and pulse like its arms. Then a pair of big feathery black wings burst out of the thing's back. None of us moved a muscle the entire time. You may think us stupid for not bolting the moment that thing started to move, but understand this. Until you've seen what I have, you'll never understand what that kind of terror does to your body. We were all paralyzed, and as much as our minds screamed for us to run, our legs wouldn't listen. All we could do was watch like the helpless things we were. As the barbed wire started to unravel and the monster dropped from its post, its body making more of those sickening cracks and pops as it stood, Andy managed to let out one more shriek that somehow freed us from our paralysis. The thing wrapped a large clawed hand around the boy's head and leapt into the air carrying Andy up with it. We were all in hysterics. Peter especially. He was screaming and crying, calling out Andy's name and begging for him back. Carol Ann was just mumbling to herself with this foggy look on her face. And all I can remember was screaming at the top of my lungs that we needed to run. Eventually, the two of them realized I was right, so we ran as fast as we could. We didn't make it far before Andy's body fell from the sky in front of us. Every bone in the body looked broken, and there was so much blood. 
Peter started throwing up. And while he was doubled over, the thing swooped down and landed right on him. I didn't stay to watch what happened. I just grabbed Carol Ann's arm and we kept running. We were so close. And I could just make out the wooden fence when Carol Ann's hand was yanked from mine. I turned just in time to watch that monster drag her away. A pang of grief stabbed at the old farmer. His voice grew full of shame and regret as he forced himself to keep talking. For a moment, I thought about going back for her, trying to fight the thing and save Carol Ann, but I knew that was suicide. I did the less noble thing. I kept on running until I hit that fence, and I remember climbing over it and landing on my hands and knees on the other side. And when I turned around, there the thing was perched on the fence like a gargoyle. I was sure this was it, that the monster was going to rip me apart, but it didn't. It just sat there on the fence staring at me with its single bulging, hate-filled eye. Then it darted back towards the property. I managed to get to my feet just in time to watch it return to the fence with Carol Ann. She was alive. Both her legs were broken. It dropped her a few feet away from the fence on his side and just stared at me. She tried to crawl, but the thing just pulled her back if she got too close. She was sobbing, begging me to help her. I took a single step towards her, but I saw the eagerness in the monster's eye. I understood what it was doing. It was trying to lure me back onto the property because it couldn't leave. I told Carol I was sorry and I started to step back. Once it knew I wasn't taking its bait, the scarecrow let out a wail like I've never heard before. It pounced on Carol. It snapped both of her arms like twigs, and once she couldn't defend herself, it tore into her with those talons. I watched helplessly while the monster tore the flesh off of her beautiful face, and then, as it plucked out her eyes, she, she was alive for all of it. She was screaming my name and begging me to help her. Then it took her tongue, and she was quiet. Once she was gone, I watched it drag her body back towards the farmhouse. Tears welled in the old man's tired eyes. He stifled a sniffle as he wiped them away before finishing. The police found all three of their bodies impaled on the dead oak tree the next morning. I was so scared they'd pin it all on me, but there was never an investigation. People knew what happened. And like they had so many times before, they turned a blind eye to it. You can believe whatever you want, boy. But I know what I saw on the Dupree's farm that night. What I've just told you is the Lord's truth, and it's why you're forbidden from ever setting foot on that property. Thomas sat quietly, trying to process his grandfather's words. His head raced, and his skeptical resolve started to waver, but only for a moment. It was quite the tale, but that's all it was. A tale, meant to scare a child into behaving. Thomas wasn't a child even if he still didn't know the reasons for it. He assured his grandfather that he understood and would never set foot on the property again. Under cover of night, while his grandfather slept, Thomas snuck out and crossed the fence onto the abandoned land. 
he made his way to the old farmhouse where the scarecrow waited. To Thomas's unease, the thing was just how his grandfather had described, right down to that unsettling pose. His grandfather had gotten a lot of things right, in fact, like the dead silence of the area. Thomas shook away his paranoid thoughts. There was a simple explanation for all of it. His grandfather, indeed, had been on the farm, but he'd just chickened out. That was it. Satisfied with that explanation, Thomas began climbing the wooden post like a tree. The hat was nearly in his grasp when he saw it. A single red, veiny eye with a pale, milky iris staring him down. He fell from the post with a terrified scream, and as he lay there on the ground, coughing and trying to catch his breath, he realized just how wrong he'd been. As the scarecrow's stitched mouth tore open into a large, nightmarish grin.